Matthew, the 12th chapter, is an almost unbelievable story about the unbelief of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. In Matthew 12, verse 22, they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. But Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. Now, I have often thought, whenever I read this verse, what would it have been like to be there and to watch Jesus open the eyes of the blind man so the very first thing he saw in his entire life was the face of the Savior? Wouldn't you love to have been there to see that happen? Amen. You would think the people would just be rejoicing and shouting, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, worship the Messiah. He's here. But they didn't. Verse 23 says, All the people were astonished, and they said, Is he the son of David? Is he the Messiah? Instead of rejoicing in what God had done, they went running to their pastors. And they said, what about that? You tell us. Is he the Messiah? Verse 24, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, no, that's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow dries out demons. He's not the Messiah. He's a demon. He's not the Messiah. He's a devil. Reminds me of the old saying, if you can't fault the message, then shoot the messenger. That's nothing new. That's what they did back then. They couldn't fault anything Jesus said or anything that he did. And so what else are they going to do? They didn't want to believe him. So they have to shoot the messenger. Oh, no, he's not the Messiah. He's the devil. The devil uses that same tactic all the time, even now today. Some of you have been warned. You've told me. Some of you have been warned not to go to Revelation now. That's a cult over there. If you can't fault the message, then call him a name. Shoot the messenger. Oh, don't go listen to old Cologne. He's a cult. He's a demon. He'll lead you to the pathways of hell without one single text to back it up. The devil's always worked that way. So if anybody tells you, oh, don't go there. It's a cult. Just rejoice and know you're in good company because that's what they did to Jesus. So Jesus said, in verse 31, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit, that will not be forgiven. There is a sin that God is not going to forgive. What is it? blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He'll forgive every other sin, but he won't forgive blasphemy against the Spirit. Well, what's that? We've just seen it. Jesus performed the miracle. He opened the eyes of that blind man. He opened his mouth of the dumb so that he could talk, and they all said, no, that was not God, that was the devil. It wasn't the Holy Spirit, it was the devil. So to attribute the obvious work of the Holy Spirit of God and say that that was not the Holy Spirit, that was the devil, is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and it's a sin that cannot be forgiven. A lot of people say, boy, am I glad to hear that. I'll make sure I never do that. Well, fine. I hope you don't. 
But there are two problems. First of all, it doesn't take the unpardonable sin to be lost. People are going to be lost for plain old unpardoned sin. You don't have to blaspheme the Holy Spirit to be lost. You don't have to commit the unpardonable sin. That's the first problem. Second problem is that those Pharisees, those religious leaders, those popular pastors and teachers, at first they never dreamed that they would ever commit the unpardonable sin. They never thought for a moment that they would ever say the work of the Holy Spirit was just the devil. Well, then how did they get there? How did they arrive at the place where they were willing to say that was not the Holy Spirit, that was the devil knowing it was the Spirit all along? How did they get there? That's what we want to talk about. That's the unpardonable sin. That's the mysterious way of sin. How did they get there? Jesus shows us in verse 30, just before he made that statement, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. So Jesus is stripping away any possibility of being neutral about God. You can't be neutral about God. It was the attempt to be neutral that paved the way to the unpardonable sin. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. So I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, men, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. They were trying to be neutral, and it was the attempt to be neutral that paved the way to the unpardonable sin. You cannot be neutral about God. You can be neutral about a lot of things. It's fun around election times when it comes around and watching all the politicians trying to be neutral. <laughs> they go to one group and, and what do you think about this? You know, and they know what that group wants to hear and so they try to be neutral. And then they go to another group and they might say just the opposite to that group. You can be neutral about politics. You can be neutral about a lot of things, but you can't be neutral about God. You cannot come to the Bible, discover the truth in God's Word, and then walk away the same person you were when you first came. Either we're with Him or against Him. You can't be neutral. Either you're gathering with Him or you are scattering. That's what Jesus Himself said. There's no straddling the fence. And anyone who tries to straddle the fence is sooner or later going to have to make an excuse to explain why they haven't made a decision to follow God and that excuse makes them the enemy to God. That's how the mysterious way of sin works. You can't straddle the fence. If the truth is the truth, then either you're with it or against it. Either we're gathering with Him or scattering. As I studied through this in the Bible, I discovered there are five basic excuses that Jesus heard when he was here on this earth. And I found out after, didn't take me 35 years of doing this to find out. Learned pretty quickly. Same devil that worked in the time of Jesus is still at work right now. Because I hear those same five excuses even yet today. In fact, one time we were on the East Coast and uh, got down towards the end of the... In fact, we are just about this night. It was this night. I was visiting a fella before the meeting at his home and he hadn't even accepted Jesus as his Savior. I said, hey, you've been coming to these meetings now for four weeks nearly and you haven't accepted Jesus. What's standing in your way? And he went down the list. One, two, three, four, five, all five of them. He gave me an excuse. Later on that night, it came to the meeting. It happened to be this topic. Wow, he got mad at me. And afterwards, he said, you told them everything I said to you today. <laughs> I said, let me see your printout. 
So he hands me his printout, and I said, look, they're all right here. I didn't print this up between the time I left your house and got here tonight. The same devil that was at work in Jesus' day is the devil at work right now, except he's a couple of thousand years better at it now. So would you like to know what those five excuses are? Unanswered questions prevent people from following the Lamb. That was one excuse. Unanswered question. I don't understand everything about the Bible yet. I hear that all the time. Oh, there's just so much I've learned of Revelation now. I don't understand it all. As soon as I understand everything that I've been studying here, then I'll be ready to follow Jesus. Folks, there are some things in the Bible you're not going to understand until we're at the other side, until we're on the other side. You're not going to understand it. We're trying to understand an infinite God with a peanut brain, and it just doesn't wrap around an infinite God. There are some things in the Bible I don't understand. I've been studying this for a long time. There are things in here I don't understand. When I get to heaven, I got a little notebook I hope the Lord lets me take with me. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to visit with some people. Paul. I want to sit down with Paul. And I'm going to say, Paul, you see that verse? Why did you write that? You know how much trouble you caused me? <laughs> sure, there are things in here that are hard to understand. Peter didn't even understand it all. He admitted that. He said, Paul wrote stuff that are hard for us to understand. So if it was hard for Peter, don't be surprised if there are things that we can't understand that we can't answer but I can tell you this I may not be answer, able to answer every question about everything in the Bible but God has made it plain enough for me to know that I can trust him and that if I can't answer every question the ones I can answer are enough to give me confidence that I can trust him with the ones I can't Amen. there are enough answers in this book so that no one has any excuse to not accept Jesus Christ I mean, we, we don't want to be like a fool caught on top of a 14-story building that's on fire and the stairways are burning and the elevators are burning. There's no way to him to get down. And he hollers out the window, help me, help me. And he looks down and there are the firemen. And they got this big net down there spread out. And they said, jump, jump, and we'll catch you. And he says, whoa, wait a minute, I got questions first. They said, well, don't worry about the questions. Jump and then we'll catch you and answer your questions after. Well, well I don't know about that. How did this fire get started in the first place? <laughs> How do I know the net's strong enough? How do I know you won't drop it and let me go down and die? Sure, there are questions, unanswered questions. The Bible shows us here in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, verse 28, they hurled insults at him, the disciples. They said, you're this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. Now, we know that God spoke to Moses, but this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Who's his father anyway? Unanswered questions. That's one of the excuses Jesus heard. We've got to understand it all. We have to know all about the incarnation. How could he be the son of God? We have to understand all of that. You'll never fully understand how God could become man, but there's enough in here for me to know I can trust him. And then in chapter, in chapter 7, verse 41, some were saying, Who is this man? Surely he's a prophet. Others said, no, he's the Christ. Still others said, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Verse 42, doesn't the Scripture say that Christ will come from David's family, Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus, verse 43, the people were divided because of Jesus. I hear that sometimes, too. Oh, that cologne, he's divisive. Don't go to that church. They divide Christianity. They divide Christianity over those who want to keep Sunday and those who keep the Sabbath. They divide us. No, they don't. Truth always divides. Truth always divides because those who don't want to accept truth are going to reject it and hate the ones who teach it. 
Truth always divides. But it's not the truth so much that divides. It's those who don't want to accept the truth and reject the truth. They don't want to bring it into their hearts. They don't want to make change. And so they attack the truth. Yeah, that's a demon or a devil without one, one Bible verse. Or if they do give you a vi Bible verse, they just take it and twist it so much out of context that anybody can see that it's not making sense. That's the mysterious way of sin. And then the second excuse, probably the one I hear the most, usually sounds like, the, oh, here it is in the Bible. Let me read that first. In verse 30, 32, John 7, Pharisees heard the crowds whispering things about Jesus, and so the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to go and arrest him. Go get him, arrest him, bring him back here. So the guards went, and they went to arrest Jesus, and when they came back, no, Jesus. Why didn't you bring them here? Verse 46. I love this answer. Because no one ever spoke the way this man does. <laughs> Don't you like that? They went to arrest Jesus, didn't come back with him. Where is he? Why didn't you bring him back? Whoa, man, nobody ever spoke like he did. I never heard the Word of God so clearly. I've never seen the Bible so clearly explained, and it makes so much sense to me. No one sp spoke like he does. Their hearts burned inside. Now watch what the religious leaders said. These were the most powerful preachers in the land. And here's what they said, verse 47. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted, have any of the rulers, have any of the Pharisees believed in him? No, just this mob. They know nothing about the law, the Bible. There's a curse on them. Let me tell you what it sounds like today. If those Adventists were teaching the truth, if Saturday is really the Sabbath day and not Sunday, why doesn't everybody else see it? Why is it they're the only church that teaches it? Are you trying to say everybody else is wrong? You see, and they try to make it look like the one teaching the truth is the one at fault for saying that everybody else is wrong. Have any of the Pharisees believed them? No. Truth is not popular. And that's one of the big excuses I hear. Well, I don't understand. How can Saturday be the Sabbath? Look at all the other churches go on Sunday. The question isn't what all the other churches do. The question is, what did God say? And I want to tell you something. Anybody who asks the question, why does everybody else do Sunday when the Bible says Saturday, anybody that asks that question, question is beginning to understand the power of the Antichrist because the whole world is going to worship the beast except for the few whose names are written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb. Jesus himself said, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are going to go there but straight and narrow the way that leads to life, only a few are going to find it. That tells me that if everybody believes one thing, then watch out because it's probably not correct. Only a few are going to embrace the truth about Jesus. He said that himself. So don't go looking for the most popular teaching. Look for the most biblical teaching. And then you know that you're standing on solid ground. The truth has never been popular. It wasn't even popular in the Garden of Eden. There was a woman and there was a, a snake and the man and the snake said, you think you're going to die? You're not going to die. Eat it. And so they ate it. All three of them believed the lie. The truth wasn't even popular then. We learned last time the truth wasn't popular in the days of Noah. Only one man on the entire planet Earth got it right. One preacher. 
everybody else was wrong. Truth isn't popular. Never was popular. Never will be. Elijah, one man of God on Mount Carmel, 850 false prophets, the king and all the other people, and that one man of God dressed in his funny-looking camel head robe was the only one that got it right. Don't go around taking surveys to find the truth. You find the truth by standing in the Word of God. Keep your nose in this book, folks. Follow the Lamb. And that's the only way to find the truth. Don't follow me. Don't follow my church. Follow Jesus Christ. A man was walking to the city of Jerusalem one day 2,000 years ago. And he sees this man hanging on a cross between two other men. And he looks up there, and the one in the middle had a sign on his cross, and it said, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And he asked the Roman soldier standing at the foot of the cross, Is that true? Is that really the Messiah? Is that Jesus, the King of the Jews? And the Roman soldier laughs and says, Does he look like it? Look at him. But he's not convinced. So he goes into the city, and he looks for the biggest temple he can find, and there the high priest is getting ready to offer the lamb for a sacrifice while the lamb of God is hanging on the cross. And he says, excuse me a minute, sir, can I ask you something? Certainly, what is it? That man out there on the cross, is he the Messiah? It says he is. Is he really the Son of God? Is he Jesus, the Son of God? And the priest smiles and says, no, he's not the Son of God. And while our friend is walking across the courtyard of the, the, the city, he sees, someone sees him and says, You, I saw you talking to him out there. I saw you. You're one of his disciples. And Peter says, I never knew that cursed man. How do you find truth? By asking people? By taking a survey? by believing what God said. Third excuse. Cost too much. Rich young man came up to Jesus one time. What should I do to be saved? Oh, keep the commandments. Oh, I've done that ever since I was a little boy. No problem. But Jesus said, you lack one thing. Sell everything that you own and give it to the poor. Take up your cross and follow me. And the rich young man turned his back and walked away because it cost too much, he thought, to follow Jesus. He prized his earthly possessions more than God. Sometimes people with that same excuse today cost too much can't afford to pay tithe or offerings. Folks, it doesn't cost too much. God gives us everything we have. He just wants a tenth back. God's a God who could take a couple of fish and five loaves of bread and feed a multitude. He can take your 90% and make sure that you're going to be able to survive with it. In fact, he's going to make sure you do more with the 90 than you could if you kept it all to yourself. You can't afford not to follow God. Some people say, oh, Pastor, I, 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 can't, I can't do that. I can't follow Jesus because I have to work on Saturday and I have to feed my family. God knows that. He knows that. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he'll supply what you need. He knows you need clothes. Look at the birds, how pretty they are. The grass and its plant. He knows you need all this. He knows you need a roof. Seek ye first his kingdom. He's going to take care of what you need, and he'll never let you down. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to get whatever you want. He says, I'll give you whatever you need if you keep him first. And you can claim that promise. 
And I've seen it happen over and over again. I remember we were in Kentucky and uh, doing a revelation now. A young man came to the meeting. This was back in the 70s. And he was a real genuine hippie. <laughs> Didn't have any money. He had long hair. And he had a necklace on with the big peace sign. Walked around peace, peace. I mean, real hippie. He'd been hitchhiking across the country. Didn't have any money. Stopped there just about the time we were doing Revelation now because he needed to get a little job to get some money so he'd go on a little bit. Came to Revelation now and heard about Jesus. Gave his heart to Jesus. Became a Jesus hippie. It's the best kind. Then he learned about the Sabbath. And he made a decision to start keeping the Sabbath. He had been there for a while. He was such a hard worker that they kept promoting him. At first, he was just unloading trucks. By the time we got there, he had worked up to be the, uh, the manager of the electronics department. Radios, TVs, stereos, all that stuff. And, and he said, I want to keep the Sabbath. But wow, that's our biggest day. And I'm the department manager. We all have to be there on Saturday. He says, what can I do? I said, well, it's easy. Just follow the Lamb. Do what Jesus wants you to do. What does he want you to do? He wants me to keep the Sabbath. I said, well, do that. He said, okay. So I gave him some tips on how to talk to his supervisor. And he went in to talk to his supervisor. And his supervisor gave him Sabbath off. Came to the meeting that night, just happy as he could be. Hey, pastor, pastor, it worked, it worked. The Lord did it for me. I don't have to work on Saturdays. All I need to do now is go in and work late on Friday nights, and I don't have to go in on Saturdays anymore. I almost threw up. <laughs> I forgot to tell him about that. I didn't have the heart, but it was the truth. I had to tell him. And I said, well, you know, I, I forgot something. I explained it to him, and his face just dropped. I can't go back in there again. Oh, yeah, yeah, God did it once. He can do it again. Come on now. Boy, everything inside of me was just churning. He says, okay, I'm going to do it. He goes in, comes back the next night. I did it, I did it. Now all I need to do is go in Saturday night after sundown and work late at night, and I don't have to work on Sabbath anymore. Praise the Lord. You can't afford not to follow God. Take your stand. He can help you. He'll provide what you need not a good excuse now, I'm not going to promise you that if you keep the Sabbath you'll never lose your job and you always get a better one I'm not going to promise you that because the time's coming when we're going to die we need to be willing to die because of our faith in God Amen. but I can promise you God will take care of you that's what he promised us and then there's another excuse this is the toughest of all the devil doesn't play by the rules. He's not afraid to kick when you're down. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. One of the hardest things that I think Jesus said. It took me a long time to even begin to try to understand this one. He said, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against a mother, a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law, a man's enemies to be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Wow, how could Jesus ever say that? I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. He's the prince of peace. What did he mean? I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to turn a man against his father and a father against his... What did Jesus mean by all of this? Well, I thought about it and prayed about that for a long time. I said, Lord, please help me to understand this. And finally came to the conclusion that true love is a triangular relationship. That's what I told my wife when we got married. I said, now you need to know something. You're number two in my life. Is that okay? She said, that's okay as long as God's number one. Because you see, when we put God number one, that's best for us. He's at the top of the triangle. We're at the bottom of each corner. The closer you get to God, the closer you get to each other. Amen? Amen. It's a triangular relationship. And that's what this is all about. 
You see, the moment you accept Jesus as your Savior, at that moment you have peace with God. And you know that. A lot of you experience that. You have peace with God. Some of you for the first time in the last couple of weeks. But at that very same instant, you become an enemy to the world. There is no such thing as peace with God and peace at the world. The world hates God. And if you are right with God, you become an enemy to the world, and they're going to hate you. He didn't come to make peace with the world. He came to make peace with those who have fed up to here with the world and want something better. Amen. You see, when a man puts his wife's desires over God, then he's really saying that you're more important to me than God is. And folks, if, I mean, if we're really honest, the thing we want more than anything else is for our husbands and wives and families to be together in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? We want to all be together. But if we say, well, if you don't want me to get baptized, I won't. I love you so much, honey. Oh, dear, I just won't do it. Then you're saying God is more important. And you're tying God's hands. He can't use you to win the ones you want more than anything else. It's only when we take our stand for God and put Him first, then He can use you to reach the ones you love the most. Amen. Now, I'm not saying it will always work that way, but at least you're giving God a chance. Amen. We were in Louisville, Kentucky. Big Revelation Now meeting. A big auditorium, downtown Louisville. And there's a young couple coming. The first night, a couple of nights sitting right in the front row, and then the third night, I noticed that he wasn't there anymore. She was all by herself. So afterwards, I'd gotten acquainted with him a little bit. And afterwards, I went down and I said, hey, where's George? Oh, he's not going to come anymore. Oh, why not? Well, he just says he's not really that interested. But you're going to keep coming. Oh, yeah, I'm going to come every night. And she did. She came every night all by herself. She and a friend, but not with George. Well, after we got down towards the end the spirit convicted her heart and she came down forward in an altar call and said pastor I want to get baptized I want to follow the lamb I want to get baptized so she went home and told George you need to come to the meeting in a few more nights because I'm going to get baptized and I want you to see me he says you're going to get baptized she says yeah I'm going to get baptized I'm going to follow the lamb and he said over my dead body no wife of mine is going to be some goody-goody Christian. I don't need that around here. If you want to get baptized, then you go find some other place to live. What would you do? Now, I know what you think you would do. But when you come right down to the reality of it, it's not that easy. And she had a, a huge decision to make. And she came back to the meeting and she said, Pastor, George said, I can't get baptized. And I said, what are you going to do? She said, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Pastor, what should I do? I said, well, what does Jesus want you to do? Jesus wants me to get baptized. I said, why don't you just follow the lamb? Leave it up to him. You trust him? She said, I do. She said, I want to be baptized tomorrow night. So tomorrow night comes. A friend went to pick her up, and George got so mad he locked her up in the bedroom. She couldn't get out. The friend's out there honking the horn. So she opens the window and hollers out there, George, lock me in the bedroom. I can't get out. Well, he's so embarrassed and angry at her that he opens the door. He says, go ahead, go ahead and go. Do whatever you want to do. But if you get baptized, don't come back. And I mean it. What would you do if that was you? 
she came to the meeting that night and she had a little plastic bag with her clothes in it. And she was baptized. And I want to tell you something. It brought tears to my eyes when she came up out of that water with the most peaceful expression on her face, knowing what she faced ahead. That's the peace that passes understanding the Bible talks about. The world can't understand that. She went home, and the next night, George was sitting in the front row right next to her. Seek ye first my kingdom and my righteousness. I'm not going to promise you that if you take your stand that those who oppose you are going to all of a sudden change their minds. It doesn't happen. Everybody has to make their own choice. But what I'm telling you is that when you stand for God, you're doing the one thing that enables God to use you to reach out to the ones that you love the most and you're giving them the best opportunity. Family. Oh, what an excuse. What an excuse. And then... The last one, James wrote, He who knows what is right and does it not, for him it is sin. A lot of times people ask me, what about my grandma and grandpa? They never heard about all this, but they were such good Christians. He who knows what is right and does it not, for him it is sin. God doesn't hold us accountable for what we don't know, but he certainly holds us accountable for what we know. Now notice, he who knows what is right and does it not. It doesn't say he who feels that it's right and does it not. But he who knows the truth. And I hear so many times people tell me, what do you think? Well, what you've been learning here, fellow oh, pastor, I have never learned so much in my life as I have in the last four weeks that we've been studying together. Sabbath too? Oh, yeah, I understand that. That was so clear to me. I've never seen Have you thought about keeping it yet? Well, I'm praying on that one, pastor. And when the Spirit moves me and I feel convicted, I'm going to do it. Now, some of you have said that. I'm not picking on you. I've been preaching this for 35 years, saying the same thing. There's nothing in the verse that says, wait till you feel moved by the Spirit to do right. Jesus didn't feel right when he hung on the cross and said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Feelings are tricky. Feelings make us want to put off and delay acting on what we know is right. And that's a dangerous thing to do. It's dangerous. Because God made us in such a way that we can tune out things that bother us and get on with life. You get a new job. It requires you to get up an hour earlier in the morning to get to work on time. So you set your alarm an hour earlier. In the morning the alarm goes off and you are not ready to get out of bed yet. And so you reach over there trying to find that snooze button. You, oh man, it's too early. I just need five more minutes. You know the five minutes of sleep you get after you turn that snooze button off? That's the best all night, isn't it? <laughs> and so you hit the snooze button Five minutes, that's all. And then you get up, and then the next morning the alarm goes off. Snooze button again. Oh, man, I'm not ready. Well, this goes on about three or four times, and then one morning you wake up, and the angle of the sun's a lot higher than it's been. And you're hearing sounds that you weren't hearing before. And you're saying, Pastor, sounds like you're talking from experience. Yeah, I'm afraid I am. I missed a flight. When I was in the Air Force, I missed one of my missions. I slept through it. So I know what it's like to sleep through the clock. 
So you look at that clock and you pick it up and you're already late for work. You shake it. So, Why didn't you ring? <laughs> when you look at it, you realize it did ring. It rang all the way down. You didn't even hear it. So you rush out of bed, get dressed real quick, rush down to work, and then that day on the way home you stop at the hardware store and you buy one of those old-fashioned double-clinging alarm clocks, you know, double bell on top. <laughs> Maybe a wash tub to invert and put it on top of that just to make sure. Yeah, in the morning, that thing goes off. You know what happens. Well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because, you see, God made us so that we can tune out those distracting alarm clocks and anything that distracts us. I remember when I was a single pastor, been a bachelor for 32 years, and I took pretty good care of myself so I could go to the store every week and buy my weekly bag of beans and rice. That was the only thing I knew how to make. <laughs> and then I'd see the mothers there with their carts all full of stuff flowing over and kids tugging at their skirts and jeans and knocking things off the shelves. I'm thinking, how do they keep their sanity? Got married, had to, now I know. <laughs> God made us so that we can tune out distracting things. I was studying the Bible with a lady one time. Had a little boy about that big. I don't know if you ever visited people that have little boys about that big, but I can promise you every time you go, they're going to go get every toy out of their toy box one at a time and bring them out there to you to play with. So I'm sitting there trying to study the Bible. And here he comes with a police car. Woo, 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 woo. And then he comes with a train. You know, choo, choo, choo. Up my leg, down the other leg. Airplane dive bomber. Yeah. <laughs> About to tear my Bible apart. And she says, oh, don't pay any attention to him. I don't even hear him. <laughs> and she didn't. <laughs> you see, God made us so we can tune out distracting things. I, I remember the first week I was on alert assigned to the, the 62nd Bomb Squadron in Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana, B-52 crew. And we had to live in a little building right outside on the end of the runway just beside all the bombers loaded with, with, with fuel and nuclear weapons ready to go to war. This is way back in the Cold War times. And we had to live right there, sleep there, waiting for that alarm to blow off and send us off to war. All day long, the first day, we were in target study, simulator practice, going over the mission over and over and over again. I was so tired. Got home, got to my, not home, got to my bed that night sitting out there. I don't know if you ever tried to sleep on the end of a runway with eight, eight engines of a B-52 jet roaring over your head all night. I was just about to go off and roar, there goes the first jet. Oh! Shook me up out of my, what's that? And then I'm back to sleep again. Roar, there goes another one. All night long. And I'm thinking, a whole week of this? I'm not going to be fit to fly a mission if we have to go to war. But you know, after a few days went by, I was able to get a little bit of sleep every night. And by the end of the week, I could sleep through the night without hearing one jet take off. Because God made us to be able to tune out things that distract us. The Bible tells us that. First Timothy, in First Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 2, he speaks of those who are hypocritical liars. Uh, consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Our consciences can be seared, the Bible says, so it doesn't work on us anymore. You see, He made us so that we can tune out things that bother us, not only in the physical world, but in the spiritual world too. You know that. You know that when you discover something's true and, it's, and, and you reject it and you live the wrong way and you do the wrong things, your conscience bothers you, doesn't it? We've all experienced that. But what happens if you ignore your conscience and you do it again? It makes it easier the next time, right? And if you do it again, it makes it easier the next time until pretty soon you can do these things and your conscience won't even bother you at all. I know that's true. I've been there. 
You see, God made us that way. He made us so that we can tune out spiritual things. He made us so that we can live our lives in rebellion against God. You see, if it had been any differently, God would be acting by force instead of love. He made us so that we can reject His truth and live with that choice. Suppose He made us so that our conscience bothered us when we sin. And then the next time we do it, it bothers you worse. And then the next time, even worse. And worse and worse. Pretty soon you would get to the place to where either you better obey God or you go insane. And there would be no choice. So he made us so that we can tune out, even spiritually, things that bother us and get on with life. It's not a real peace. It's a white flag surrender kind of peace. Real peace only comes when we surrender to God, not to sin. But we can get on with life that way. Some people say when you do that, you have committed the unpardonable sin. If you sin and your conscience bothers you and you keep sinning and it doesn't bother you anymore, you've committed the unpardonable sin. That's not true. The unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's close to being the unpardonable sin. It's the next step to the unpardonable sin. I've been there. I have sat in church just because whenever I went home I went because my mom wanted me to go and I'd go with her and I'd hear a sermon and everybody's sitting there wiping tears and I look at my mother and she's there with tears streaming down her cheek and I know that those tears are for me I know that and yet I'm sitting there laughing at her on the inside how can anybody be so foolish to believe this nonsense it never touched me one bit I've been there but thank God that's not the unpardonable sin. On the way home, you do stop and you buy an old-fashioned alarm clock with that double clanging bell. In the morning when that goes off, your heart is racing. And when it settles down a little bit, you get out of bed and get dressed and you're off to work. In a few mornings of that, you don't need that old hardware store double clanging bell anymore. Your clock radio works fine. If you keep responding to that, did you know that you can wake up before the music even comes on? See, I've had those experiences too. We can become resensitized. If we don't feel the Spirit anymore, it's a dangerous thing. You're right next to committing the unpardonable sin, but we can become resensitized because if we just respond to the little bit of light that we have, then the Bible says that light shines brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And some of you may be worried. I've had people tell me, I think I did the unpardonable sin, Pastor. You wouldn't be worrying about it if you did. Amen. You wouldn't be here if you did. But I don't feel anything. I don't want to respond to any. I don't feel like responding to anything. It doesn't matter. If you're concerned about it, just respond. And that little light's going to shine brighter. And if you respond to the new light, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter until that perfect day, the Bible says, we can become resensitized. But there's another way that people try to delay and put off following Jesus, and that's to rationalize. Rationalizing is just making an excuse for what you did, explaining it away. Trying to find a loophole. I remember the first time I went to prison as a visitor. <laughs> Nebraska State Penitentiary. Our flag football team was going to go play the flag football team on the inside wall of the prison. We didn't know what that was. We just knew that's where the worst guys were. And we had pictures in our minds of the meanest, vilest looking men, so guilt ridden that they were just wanting to devour us and tear us apart. We were a little nervous about this. But do you know, when we got in there, I didn't see one guilty looking man, not one, because of rationalizing. Well, I didn't really murder the guy. He would have had a heart attack the next day anyway. Or it was just self-defense. Or I didn't do anything that any one of you wouldn't have done if you'd have been in the situation I was in. That's rationalizing. 
And the reason rationalizing is so dangerous is because the Bible says that we can come to believe a lie just as sincerely as people believe the truth. That's scary. In fact, Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, the coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved, and for this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so they'll believe a lie. I, don't, I hope you caught that. God sends the delusion. God sends the Antichrist so that those who reject him can believe the lie. And they perish not because they didn't believe the truth, but that they didn't love the truth. You can believe the truth without loving the truth. The devil believes it. He knows Jesus died on the cross. He was there, but he doesn't love it. They perish because they don't love the truth. Loving the truth is understanding the truth and bringing it into your heart. Loving the truth is not saying, well, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to pray on it. I'm going to see what God leads me to do. God leads us through this, not through this. It's dangerous to delay and put it off. I have people doing this all the time. Pastor, I'm going to get my little red notebook. I'm going to go through every one of those lessons in Revelation now is over with. And when I finish every one of those lessons, look up every text, then I'm going to be ready to get baptized and follow the Lamb. 35 years we've been doing this. I'm still waiting for the first person to tell me they did it. If we don't respond when Jesus calls us, how can we think we're going to respond after? Because the longer we wait, the harder it gets. Today is the day. Now, a young boy was born into a poor family, lived in the Swiss Alps. They didn't even have enough money to keep food on the table. So this young fellow's job was to go out into the woods and to spot big eagle nests. And he knew how to tell when the time was just right. He could climb that tree and take the eggs out of the eagle's nest, and he would use those eggs to contribute to help feed the family. This one particular time he found an eagle's nest high up on a ledge. And he kept watching it and watching it and finally decided this is the right time. I'm going to climb way up there and get it. No problem. He's done this kind of thing all along. So he goes up to the, lead, the wall and it's just a sheer straight up wall. There's no way he's going to climb that. Oh, no problem. He knew those mountains like the back of his hand. So I'll go around the back side, and then I'll go up over the top and come down, and I can get the eggs. Well, he went to the back side, but he discovered that that ledge was down beneath and below. It was an actual overhang, and there was no way he could climb down that way to get the eggs. Still no problem, because he had a rope with him. So all I need to do is just tie this rope to a tree. So he tied his rope to a tree, and then he put a few knots in the end, let it down over the side of the cliff. And then his thought was that he would lower himself down on the rope until his feet were level with that ledge. Then he could swing and swing wide enough that he could just jump off the ledge and grab those eggs and then climb back up the rope. So he did that. He climbed down on the rope. He had knots there to keep his hands from slipping. And there he is hanging hundreds of feet up in the air, He's not afraid. He'd done that many, many times. So he starts to swing wider and wider and wider until finally all he did was just step off on that ledge. When he bent down to pick up those eggs, he froze in a moment of panic because he realized he had let go of the rope and watched it swinging away. You know, in times like that, our thoughts go through our mind rapidly. And he thought about a lot of things. He said, well, I'm going to climb up. But he couldn't because that was just an overhang. No way to climb up. I'll climb down too straight. Couldn't go down. I'll call for help. He knew he was so far away nobody would ever hear him. He also knew that in a few days he'd get so weak he'd be easy to pray for that mother eagle and she would tear him to shreds. And he realized the only hope he had was that rope. And he knew that the first time that rope came back, 
it would be as close as it would ever get. If he waited for the second time, it would be a little further out there, and another time even further out. And if he waited too long, that rope would be hanging motionless far out of his reach. The rope was coming. He had to make a decision, and he needed to decide right then. So the young fellow stood on the edge of that cliff, toes hanging over the end. The rope is moving towards him. He bends his knees, flexes his muscles, and at just the split second instant when that rope held still before it began to go back the other way, with all of the strength and energy he could muster, he leaped out into space grabbed the rope, and climbed to safety. For some of you, that rope is still swinging, and it will never be any closer than it is right now. The longer we wait to follow the lamb, the more difficult it's going to be until it's far out of our reach. Today is the day if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Respond to him. Follow the Lamb.